one of the things that we discovered when we read Jude, by the way, uh, for those of you that are new, we tend to map out a text and try to read with it with uh, a sense of flow. But what we discovered in Jude is that Jude tended to uh, have main points where he's, he basically tells his readers what he wants them to do. You know, I want you to contend for the faith. And a little bit later, uh, he explains to them how to do that. But then he also has along the way these descriptions of the opponents that are in that are in the context of Jude here. And these seem to be more descriptive, although they may be stock descriptions. And by that, I mean kind of the standard things you would say about somebody that was evil or a false teacher. But there are along the way, certain people are described. And again, if you keep working through the text in verse eight, they're described again. In verse 10, they're described again. Well, each of these descriptions tend to be supported by ancient text because Jude said that these people's condemnation was written about long ago. And he pulls up either examples or text that he believes applies to the false teacher. And he uses a variety of sources. For example, uh, in verse five, it's clearly the number story, the those that were destroyed in the wilderness. In verse six, it's clearly the uh, uh, the, the fallen angels of Genesis 6, but it seems to be informed by the expansion of that tradition in First Enoch. And then Sodom and Gomorrah, we know that story from Genesis, and you see how this works. And so it's very structured in the sense that there's main points, what he wants his readers to do, there's descriptions of the opponent, and then there's the historical literary supports for uh, what he's saying about the opponents. Okay, that was last time. This is this time, so I want to drop it here and just spend a little bit of time, particularly right here uh, in verse 20, where he actually tells the readers what to do. Contending for the faith for Jude actually had boundaries. It wasn't like say anything you want to. It's here's what you do. Is, here's what uh, you do to, to, to contend for the faith. Build yourself up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in God's love, and then a descriptor phrase, as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Remember, mercy was in the greeting of Jude back at the beginning. Be merciful, you hear that theme coming up? Be merciful to those who doubt, snatch others from the fire and save them, and to others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. And so what we have here is how Jude is recommending to his congregations that despite the fact that there's these uh, interlopers that have come in and have caused a great deal of trouble, here's what they're to do. And notice how much it is to focus on your own relationship. I'm going to summarize it and kind of compress it. Focus on your own relationship with Jesus when times are really hard. And when those that you expect to be leaders aren't doing their job. I'm probably not going to say much more than that because obviously we want to talk about the canon, but I want you to see how this letter works is that, and notice I've put all of this stuff to the, uh, the far left as this is what he's asking his readers to do. Any questions there? I see two comments in the chat. Anything, Jana? Just folks chatting. Okay. Yes, Very just good. Chatting. One of the one of my favorite uh, doxologies or closing of any letter is the one in Jude. To him who is able to keep, and I, I've underlined or I've uh, highlighted the word keep because that word keeps showing. The word keep keeps showing up. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. Echoes the language of first Enoch, by the way. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. So my quick kind of in summary for Jude is 
when everything's working against you, that is when, when it does not look like the, the horizon looks good, keep close to God and God will keep you. Dr. Haslund, I like the word keep because it has that um, context or understanding right within the word that there's something that you've been doing for a while. Yeah. Often we think that when we run into trouble, that's when we first run to God, but we don't even run to him unless we've practiced that before. Mm -hmm. right? like there's, a, there, there's an ongoingness that, that the word keep is. It sounds simple, but it's in the every day that we learn. Maybe it's even in the, in the prior verse where he talks about being merciful to those who doubt. Uh, when then you get into a situation where somebody is really uh, um, confronting the scripture mm -hmm. uh, or um, questioning the scripture, it to me, it just shows if you've been through that and you're thinking through that yourself, mm -hmm. you can be merciful, but you're keep, you keep going to the set to that to that. Uh, well, it says to the only God and Savior, right? Mm -hmm. he, there's something in that word that just really makes me uh, confident. Very good. Again, if you have any other questions about Jude, we can come back to it. Jude is a for for being such a really small letter. It it actually is a lifetime of study. There. And one of the things I like about Jude, particularly as we mature as Christians, is that it pushes us into other literature beyond the scriptures that begin to help us read scripture better, too. So, so one cannot really do justice to Jude without spending some time with First Enoch. So, well, let's switch gears and let's start talking about canon. Because Jude's obviously one that has always caused me a bit of trouble. I want you to, I want you to begin to think that um, the early, at least in the first hundred years, I'm not sure the early Christians had a sense of a New Testament canon. By the way, the, the notion of New Testament and Old Testament doesn't come along until at least 160 or 170. That language, by the way, also shows a certain bias. It's a Christian bias. And old also tends to suggest something that is um, maybe obsolete. And I'm not sure that, at least for the first hundred years anyway, that anybody was reading the Old Testament or what we call the Old Testament as obsolete. And here's one other problem. Hebrews talks about, uh, the book of Hebrews, talks about Old Covenant and New Covenant. And we have, by this point in Christian history, by our point in Christian history, we have identified the Old Covenant with the books of the Bible. And thus the word testament, th there's the bias, right? The, the word testament is chosen because they're somehow viewed as the covenant documents themselves. Okay, so work with me. First of all, the notion of covenant as used theologically is a bit of a metaphor. And it's based on the notion that ancient cultures, it goes back to treaties between powers that would take over other powers, powers that would conquer people and they would put it, make a treaty between them. And so that's where this notion comes from. And so the book of Deuteronomy, for example, is actually set up as kind of a covenant uh, celebration, a making of covenant with blessings and curses. So if you were conquered by the Babylonians and you became one of their vassals, there would be a covenant and the covenant would be two-sided. The covenant would in fact have uh, obligations that the weaker power would have to, you know, often taxes and things like that, providing soldiers. But there would be also obligations on the part of the overlord. The overlord would promise protection and uh, defense, you know, in case of another enemy being involved. And so that notion of covenant is kind of at the heart of some of the covenant language that we find in uh, the Old Testament. If you want to take um, 
you want to take the story of Israel and come to kind of just what's the summary statement of covenant? It is, I will be your God and you will be my people. That's kind of the kind of the core of it. But the Old Testament books are not a covenant. They are the story, they are the containers of the story of the covenant. The covenant is the actual agreement, which is sometimes written down in some forms in some of those books between God and his people. And so when Jesus says that he's basically in, at the Last Supper instituting a new covenant, he's not saying, oh, by the way, I'm about to give you a new book. What he's saying is, is that God is about to, and I would say, I think this is really the right way to say it. God is about to renew his covenant with his people. The new covenant is actually more, more properly called renewed because God is still keeping his promises that he made to Abraham. And so when the early Christians uh, called the documents, the 39 documents or plus, if you use the apocrypha, and the 27 documents and that eventually, when they're named New Testament and Old Testament, it becomes confusing because we then read text that talks about the old covenant as meaning something about the books. It's not about the books. By the way, uh, the Hebrew writer talks in terms of the covenant being old and about ready to disappear. He's not talking about the Old Testament because it's still here. But he is talking about a certain relationship with Israel that is going to change. Does that make sense to you? And so you have to conceptually keep in mind that what are we talking about? Uh, and I think it's unfortunate that um, the Greeks, the Greek Christians chose the word testament to talk about the collection of books. Let's do just kind of a quick thought um, or some quick thinking about the Old Testament. When we think of canon, that is a collection of materials of authoritative material, we often think that there's some moment in history in which it is declared by somebody that this is the authoritative literature. I don't know that you get anything like that in, um, in even Jewish literature. Even Josephus recognizes that there are 22 books to the Old Testament. Now, the, word the number 22 might throw you, but you need to remember they're counting the minor prophets as one book. But it's exactly the same collection that we would call the Hebrew Bible. And by Hebrew Bible, I mean the collection you probably grew up on unless you grew up in a Catholic or um, an Episcopal environment. What's interesting is that I think most of the citations um, in the New Testament come from those 39 books. You do find some allusions to the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha are not Catholic books as they're sometimes supposed to be. They're actually much older than the Catholic Church. But they are a group of books that grow up in probably Alexandria for the most part. And they're part of the Greek speaking tradition. The Jews in Alexandria continued to write their story. And some of that story involves Jerusalem, but that's where you get the Maccabean stories and some of that. And so there's like 13 or so documents which are Bible-like, and they basically continue the story of the Old Testament for the most part, or they contain uh, poetic materials that were either used in, in devotion or in, in, uh, in worship. Josephus who's writing in about the year 110 seems to be quite happy with the fact that his 22 books, our 39 books, was in fact the established Jewish group of writings that was accepted. And so, yeah, go ahead. Um, is it quick and easy to explain how you get from 22 down to 39? If you take 12 off, that's down to 27. I yeah, didn't say I, that right. I said it yeah. backwards, but you understand. I do. Um, I don't know if I can get us all the way to 27 off the cuff here, but first and second okay. Kings, first and second Kings are one book. First and second Samuel is one book. Uh, do we have any other? Oh, first and second Chronicles are one book. So what are we down to, Karen? You're the math whiz here. <laughs> <laughs> well, three and 12 is 15 from 39. That would be 24. 
Okay, so we've got two more that are combined. Uh, Jeremiah and Lamentations are, are combined. And I don't know which one I'm missing right now. Thank you. So, so by the way, uh, the Hebrew alphabet, because it doesn't have written vowels, has 22 letters. And so it makes a nice play on the, on the Hebrew alphabet. And Dr. Helton, sorry to interrupt, but um, Phoebe had asked, are any of poetry books combined? I'm trying to think if, uh, it's eluding me. I think maybe it may be with the group of writings uh, that we call the writings that included Ruth. Ruth was not a separate book in terms of uh, history. You know, we've got Ruth with the historical books because, but Ruth is actually with a group of writings that uh, uh, Esther was in that collection too, that was used for various feasts. And maybe that's where, maybe that's where the one single book I'm missing is. So good question. And what was it combined with? It, the, they divided the, the whole canon uh, into three pieces, you know, the Torah and the, pro, or, uh, the Psalms. Poetry. Poetry, yeah. Now we've got Torah, prophets, and the writings. The, the Psalms and stuff were collected in the writings. Yeah, so you only have the, the three parts. Yeah. Any other questions, Jana? No, not about this, but maybe at the end, Ed might want to share his comment of when you were wrapping up the last okay. section. Okay. So by the time we get to the first century, there is a sense in which there is a group of writings that are special, the 22 or the 39 books. But here's what you have to remember. They're, they're not put in a single collection ever. They're scrolls. And so they're, they're kept in Jewish synagogues, often as individual scrolls that are pulled out, or maybe a collection of writing. For example, the minor prophets would have certainly been on one scroll as opposed to individual. So, and I think canon becomes more important when it's contested. And I don't know that anybody in the first century is really contesting what books are actually the books. Now, one of the challenges that I think we have is that the early Christians are reading the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And along with those books did come those extra apocryphal books. But not things like First Enoch. Listen, there's a whole collection of works that um, are known as the pseudepigrapha that nobody in the first century would have even considered, at least nobody Orthodox would have considered, either Jewish, Orthodox Jewish or otherwise, would have considered like, okay, they're part of our holy scriptures. Oftentimes what they did with these writings is that they would uh, distinguish them between um, uh, what we would call the canon, a set of books they would call useful, and then there would be a set of books, particularly later with the Christians, there would be a set of writings that were simply called the rejected ones. But it was clear that the early Christian leaders knew of these extra works. One of the ways, and this, this is something that I want to share with us today, one of the ways to get at... Um, what books are canonical is to ask the really basic question, which books are being used? And so when you're, when you're working through, say, the Gospel of Matthew, you can, you can find the, the books that are useful to the early Christians by noting that they're quoting Jeremiah or Isaiah So is there a place, and I'm going to sh stop sharing screen and let me switch programs just a little bit. 
are there any places in the New Testament where the New Testament is also being quoted? Is that an interesting question to tease with? And by New Testament here, I'm using it in our traditional 27 books. Are there any places in which Does anybody have any off the, let me tell you the, let me tell you the ones you don't think about first and then we'll look does at it. Happen, does it happen in the gospels? Does it happen in the gospels? Does it happen in the gospels? Well, that, that's the first place it happens and we don't think about it happening. But that's because most of us were raised on the notion that the gospels were somehow independent writers. The fact is, is that Mark is first. Now, listen, there, there are folks who dispute this, but th this works for me. Matthew is almost wholesale taking over Mark. And you can see that if you just put it side by side. That's why Mark becomes kind of the second cousin of a gospel by the second and third century, because most of it's in Mark or in Matthew. The problem is, is that Mark's actually doing something different than Matthew. And you have to track with Mark to appreciate what he's doing and then track with Matthew separately to understand what Matthew's doing in his, but he's largely adapting Mark. And oftentimes you can feel this because there's subtle things like correcting the tense or, or at least shifting the tense or adding transitional words that make the Greek a little better than Mark's Greek and those kinds of things. You can kind of feel some of that going on. And so you've got this You've got uh, built in, particularly with what we call the synoptic gospels, you've got the three gospels that are actually using each other's material. And so here's how I think it works best. And it does not answer all the questions. So don't, don't take this as gospel. Take this as a working theory. Mark's first. Matthew has a copy of Mark. Luke, who actually tells you at the beginning of his book, he actually has stuff. He actually has a copy of Matthew and Mark. There is a chance that Matthew and Luke also have a source that Mark didn't have because they have common stories. Which means either Matthew, Luke is taking over Matthew's story or they're both sharing a common source. That's why scholars have often theorized there has to be a collection of sayings out there. I think they probably did exist. I'm not too crazy about the, uh, the, the German theory that there's this Q document out there that I just don't find it useful. And, but we do know that one of the earliest writers after the Apostle John, a guy named Papias, wrote a uh, five volume uh, commentary on the exposition of the Lord's sayings, which would lead me to believe that he had probably a separate collection of sayings that Jesus had said. Another place where the sayings of Jesus seems to have survived is in a, um, an apocryphal work or a Gnostic work later on called uh, the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas is clearly is a group of teachings from Jesus. Some of them are very much like the ones we have in the Gospel. Some of them are a little weird, but some of them are very much like, it's different words, but it's the stories we know from our, from our canonical Gospels. Now, yeah. Uh, the, um, the twist in this story is we absolutely don't know what John is doing. He's doing his own thing. He really is. And how he relates to the synoptic material, although, although there are some stories shared in common, and there's enough that you can kind of sync the chronologies of all of it that it basically works, but the Gospel of John is kind of doing its own thing. But John is also very conversant with uh, the writings we would call the Old Testament. So you've got this quoting of other earlier sources already going on just in the nature of the Synoptic Gospels. Now, go ahead, Karen. You didn't say it, but it's my understanding that Mark was traveling with Peter and his gospel is an effort to record Peter's sermons. And that's consistent with the fact that there's no genealogy at the beginning. 
Yeah, I, and it's also consistent with uh, Peter being kind of the d dominant voice there because he's getting it from Peter's perspective. Yeah, that also, by the way, the earliest recording that we have of that being true is the guy pa the Papias that I just mentioned. Papias is the one who records that Mark was Peter's interpreter. And we're not quite sure what that meant. Does that mean that Peter preached in Aramaic and Mark's the one turning it into Greek? Or is it that Peter preached and Mark preserved these sayings in a way that was transmitted? But yeah, but the earliest tradition we have will tie the gospel of Mark to the ministry of Peter. I want to uh, take you to, um, I've, got the, I've got the program up in front of you, so let's, I want to grab a couple of texts real quick. Sorry, I hope I'm not spinning your head when I do this. In Luke 10, 7, Luke is giving uh, the story of what we call the limited commission. Jesus is sending folks out by two by two. And he says, for the worker deserves his wages. First Timothy 5.18, for scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain, which is an Old Testament text. And I'll cheat and grab it for you. It's Deuteronomy 25.4. And the worker deserves his wages, which appears to be Jesus in Luke. And notice that it set us up as if we're getting a citation. Notice we've got an introductory here in first Peter saying for scripture says, which leads us to believe we're going to get a citation from scripture. Does the end give us another citation from scripture? And the only place that we actually know, I mean, it's a pretty common proverbial saying, right? A worker deserves his, his wages, but, and there's other texts that one can get it from, but when you actually take the Greek against the two against Luke and, it's it's pretty close to the same citation yeah i think there's a little bit of a word order difference if i remember right which is not hardly anything in greek because you can move the words around and still have the same meaning is this a particular place in which we have first timothy either citing the sayings of jesus although the word scripture would lead us in the direction of thinking we have a text or does Paul have access to Luke's gospel, which is entirely possible? Let me also show uh, one other thing that I think is really challenging uh, to us. Let's go back to Jude. And I want to go to about verse, I don't know. Uh, Let's just pull Jude up. Okay, I want you to think about if the gospel has been once and for all entrusted to God's holy people, Jude is not necessarily thinking that his letter is part of that. Are you with me? You're with my logic there? Now, I'm not trying to discount Jude. I'm just saying there is a sense in which the early Christians will sometimes speak in a way that suggests that their writings are not really um, to add to. At least they're not conscious of it. I get the same sense in Hebrews, by the way, when I'm reading it. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times in various ways. That's obviously a reflection back to the story that's contained in, the, in what we call the Old Testament, right? But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. I like to suggest that what the Hebrew writer is doing is making a comment on what God has already done 
And so even he, even he is conscious of the fact when you read Hebrews, there is a sense in which this guy is, by the way, this guy is actually one generation removed. I don't know who it is. I don't know when it was written, but he actually says in chapter two, Well, let me see if I can find it. The, how shall we escape if we ignore the great salvation? I'll miss the earlier argument. This salvation was first announced to the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Do you see how the Hebrew writer is kind of sitting like a little bit? So as we get closer to the end of the, of the, the books that are written last, there is this sense in which there is... Um, the gospel itself or is, is actually already solidified without our 27 collections. The early Christians are not sitting around thinking, gee, we just need one more book and we'll have the gospel. Now, I, I would also say that the Hebrew writer, one step removed, is different than John's very immediate experience in the last book in the Bible. By the way, Revelation is the book that probably uses more of the Old Testament than any other book in the New Testament. Quite amazing. Okay. Now, let me move us. What is, if you, if you had to pick a book, some of you have been with me long enough that you may know. You had to pick what's the first book after the New Testament? Not part of the New Testament. What, what's This is where we usually go blank because we've never been taught this stuff. So if you don't know it, don't, wor don't worry about it. The Didache. Yeah, that, that would be my choice. The Didache is a document that uh, we've known about for some time. It was lost for a number of years. I think it was found about 1873 or around something like that. But, but the Didache is an early document of church order. And so if you'll just give me a second, I'll pull a piece of it up. There we go. Well, I can't spell it, so I should only spell part of it. There we go. And I'll, I'll enlarge it. This document claims to be the teaching of the Lord by the 12 apostles. Probably not. The first half of the book deals with uh, the tradition of the two ways, which is very John, sounds very much like John. There's two ways. There's a way of life and there's a way of death. And so you get some of the teaching. And after the teaching in about what's called Didache 5 or 6, we begin to switch to a really interesting set of uh, just basic rules. Hang on. Sorry to jump. I'll, I'll start with six, three here. Now concerning food, bear what you're able. Notice there's instructions about baptism. And all of which you can, uh, and scholars have done this before us, so, so we don't have to necessarily do this. But um, we can tell that there's a conversation going on with what, with texts that we know as um, texts in the, in the New Testament. I want to get to the one on the Lord's Prayer. Nor should we pray like the hypocrites. Instead, pray like this, just as the Lord commanded in his gospel. This document comes from the year, to the best of our ability, and, and I know even liberal scholars who tend to date late Put this about the year 96. This thing was written about the year of the book of Revelation. 
at least the traditional date of Revelation. It is absolutely clear that he or whoever wrote the Didache has a copy of Matthew. And you can see why I say Matthew, right? Because it's the longer version of it. So early on, the early post-apostolic Christians are not talking scripture yet, but they are saying gospel. And for them, the gospel is a group of writings that hold a level of authority with them. Also notice that there is, for the first time, that extra sentence, and it's not the one you, it's not the one you learned. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So even somebody as early as 96 said, hey, we've got to give a little more to this so this prayer actually ends. But again, everything above the blue there is in fact Matthew's. So Matthew's being used. So there is a group of writings that are called the Apostolic Fathers. They didn't circulate in this way. They've been collected later. But because of their, because their early letters uh, or early documents, they've been brought together under one heading and published. So you can get a copy of the Apostolic Fathers in a variety of forms. By the way, Penguin, the Penguin Classics, has the early writings, uh, early Christian writings, it's probably the cheapest, easiest way to get a copy and a great, easy to read, fairly English, easy to read English translation. And so I would like all, I would like all Christians to know a little bit about the uh, information that we call the Apostolic Fathers. Let me see if I've got a quick slide that I can pull up and make it a little easier for what I want to do here. And what's the name of that penguin book? I think it's called Early Christian Writings is, is simply what it's called. Yeah. Thank you. Any comments or questions while I'm, I'm looking up um, a particular slide that I know that will be helpful? Well, it's interesting to me that at the beginning of this uh, session, before you arrived, I was, <clears throat> Jana and Ed were talking about something and I was thinking like, I just, there are some things I, I don't want to know, like I would prefer not to know. I, I don't want to be naive, but I don't want to know. And it just the what's coming to my heart or to my mind now is that to remember that God used people. Yes. God used people. <clears throat> and the fact that they, that the early Christians accepted, looked forward to uh, whatever term that is, they agreed in corporate mindset. I'll use that word uh, mm -hmm. that this was this was truth this is truth yes and how to see these these um supporting like this i've never heard of this however you say it with the did yeah the dedicate dedicate i've not i don't know that i've heard of it or if i have it's, it's long forgotten it's not even a word that comes up in my i think you knew that file uh but to see the, the, that gospel good news is in that and that he is quoting Matthew is amazing to me. Mm -hmm. I so, think it's amazing. I, yeah. So I'm not quite as, Ed and Jana, I'm not quite as uh, thrown off by this. Just saying. Hold on just a second. Let me share screen one more time, folks. June, if I can just add a comment to what you said. 
the stuff that makes the press is is anything that seems to be anti uh, traditional uh, view of scripture and very True. little makes the press of all the affirming and confirming in uh, information that's out there. Yeah, yeah, it's the sensational stuff. But to actually get it, get your hands dirty in it and actually read the documents. First of all, uh, you're going to find, in my opinion, you're going to find everything that that is part of the apostolic father fathers pretty much in line with the apostolic tradition there's going to be some twists and turns you're going to say that's probably not a healthy one but overall you're going to see early christians trying to be faithful to what they've been handed down and so even that's worth um, a lot to us particularly in our time ed that these early christians are in fact endeavoring by the way uh, karen there's the copy uh, of the of the early christian writings in the penguin classic version it's called early christian writings Thank you. Let me do a little bit of uh, kind of quick history for us to um, to kind of give us a landscape of uh, because you, you really have to have a bit of a historic uh, sense of what happens after the New Testament. And this is where um, where I think we could do a better job in our churches by at least offering periodically what happens next classes. About the year 64. Peter and Paul are both gone. James is gone by 66. 66 is the number you need to get branded in your head because it's the beginning of the Jewish war. Most of the New Testament documents are probably all written, maybe all of them. Uh, maybe not. I, you know, folks struggle with, with where to put Revelation and other things. But, but by the time you get to the year 66, you've got all of your main leaders gone, at least the, the big ones. And you've got the beginning of the Jewish war which affected Christians greatly because they're still closely tied to Judaism, very closely tied. So uh, in the year 70, the temple falls, Jerusalem falls, the temple falls, the war lasts until the year 73, in which the last holdout, the zealots are taken down at Masada. Somewhere in 96, we've got the gospel of John, we've got some uh, some of the late epistles maybe who knows where to put jude is it before 66 is it after um i teach hebrews and i've really landed that hebrews is actually before the jewish war because i think he's getting his readers ready to lose all of their symbols saying you guys have all the better stuff already don't worry about it basically if you lose the temple you're going to be fine you got the better temple you got jesus the better but Hey, we're not teaching Hebrews here, so let me keep moving. In the one in the year 115 in Alexandria, Hadrian uh, somehow, I don't know all of the details, but basically he goes after the removal. The Jews probably caused some kind of a disturbance in Alexandria, and they're basically pushed out, persecuted, killed, and pushed out. Guess who probably was pushed out with them? Christians. And so you don't really hear of anything significant going on in Alexandria until about the year 160. As if Christians are kind of getting their bearings again. Guess where most of the Gnostic stuff starts coming from? Alexandria, from people who were probably not pushed out. So there's probably some significant features so you need to know that there's this particularly bad time for Jews about the year 115 in, in Alexandria. And then this one's really, the last date here is really worth knowing about. Uh, the year 135, there is um, a Jewish leader who's named Bar Kokhba, son of the star. Bar Kokhba is a messianic leader who leads a rebellion. Jews are then expelled by the Romans. So the Romans are not done with Jerusalem in the year 70. In the year 135 and thereafter, they actually take the city over, they rename it, and they make it a, a Gentile city. And they call it Aelia Capitolina. And so it's, it's several generations before Jewish folks are able to get back into Jerusalem even after that. So that's kind of some of the historic context, at least in Palestine and Alexandria during the time period we're talking about. 
So Dr. Stan, just as a sidebar curiosity, when you say it was sometime before the Jewish folks were able to get back into there, what prevented them? Was it like- Romans, uh, the Romans made it illegal for them to be there. Okay. And by the time you get to the fourth and fifth, or the fifth and sixth century, you've got uh, the Arab invasions. Yeah, Mohammed to... and his and his folks have arisen by the time you get to the fifth and sixth century, and so, so. Uh, so was, can you? I just um, I'm just thinking of illegal to be there. So coming right up current in the news that we have about. Mexicans and people coming into the states or or people um, coming from say the Ukraine or Europe into Canada, there was a process that I'm, I'm just trying to understand that there was a process for them to be allowed to come in or come through a border or like it just I, I don't know much about that okay. time. Yeah, I think the things to know in short form is that the Romans are very good at administration. Uh, and I can, I can assure you, even if I don't know the history, the yeah. Romans were administrating it. I do know that much. Yeah. So. Thank you. I didn't want to take it too far. It's just that I, I was like, how did they do that? Like, yeah. Before right. you move on. Sorry. Did, it, did I cut someone off? No. Okay. Before you move on, Dr. Um, Ed just wrote in the chat. He said regarding the Gnostic writings, was that yes. 116 or 160 AD? Uh, actually, what I think is that the more orthodox Christians are pushed out with the Jews, and what's left is a group of leaders, uh, Serensis, uh, Basilides, and, and I think they're Gentiles, and they, they are left in Alexandria, and, and so it is entirely possible that some of the earliest, now, by the way, Marcus is, uh, is believed to have been martyred in Alexandria. And so there is a beginning of what we might call an Orthodox church, but so I'm saying about the year 115, 116, after that, you have an opportunity for these Gentile Christians to rise. Is that helpful? I, I just know that there's a gap there where you don't have uh, what we would call the proto-Orthodox or the Orthodox Christians there. They would have been pushed out with the Jews. And the language gets a little hard here because when, when I say the word orthodox, I'm probably moving towards Roman Catholicism, but there is this period before we can actually say we've got Roman Catholicism, but we do have a sense of the church saying, here's what we believe, here's are the boundaries of what we believe. That's what I'm trying to set up here. That's why the history takes a little bit of time to get out in front of us. So hopefully I'm not giving you too much, but I'm giving you enough that begins to give you a little bit of a context. Uh, we use the word patristic, which, by the way, comes from the word father, the fathers, the period of the fathers, to uh, describe the time period from about the year 100 to 600. And if you're in the East, you can actually say that that same worldview, that same world existed in, until as late as 800. But normally, since we're working the Western side of things, not the Eastern side of things, the patristic period is basically we're trying to, we're trying to account for the time 100 to 600. Yeah, Karen. Define East. Um, I largely think in terms of where Istanbul is or Constantinople and just go East and West that way. It's not that pure as you know, because you've got Greek speakers in, in the Latin West and you've got Latin folks. You, so, so there's a bit of a crisscross, but, but clearly in time, you're going to get the Eastern churches, which are different than the Latin Roman church. The Roman church is going to claim to be the universal church. The churches that are left in the east, whether we're talking Constantinople or Jerusalem or Alexandria, none of them are going to claim that they're the whole ball of wax. That's why there's a bit of tension with the West, because Rome is always trying to say, again, it kind of comes from the fact that Rome was the center of the empire, right? So is that helpful? East, West, that way? Okay. The materials produced during this time can be divided in a, a variety of ways. One of the ways that they're divided is anti-Nicene versus post-Nicene. Nicaea was a particularly important council brought together by Constantine in the year 325. Some folks think that's when the canon was established. And I'm going to suggest to you, no, actually the canon's functional way before this, or what we would call the canon. Another way is, of course, then the Greek and the Latin, which we've already talked about. 
but largely the ancient writings that have come down to us, we can divide into the Anti-Nicene, that is if it's before 325, and then after 325. And I would suggest to you that the material before 325 have a more apostolic feel than the stuff you, by the time we hit after 325, after all, Constantine brought this together so that he can unify, use the church to unify his empire. So there's a different feel that you can feel as you read the material. But anyway, so you've got that. So we, we've got the, um, let me see what else. Do we have. There's another way to divide the material up. Let me just quickly introduce you to kind of ways of looking at some of this vast material. Maybe I should, let me, let me go here first. This is the American edition of what was first published in, um, in Indenburg in the early 1900s. This is a collection of the Anti-Nicene Fathers and the Nicene Fathers during the Nicene period and the post-Nicene Fathers. Nicely colored, red is Anti-Nicene. What I want you to see here is that it's gonna take your whole life to read this stuff. But I also want you to be impressed with that this is only, a, this is only what was translated at um, um, around 1900. And so there's plenty of other stuff that's come along since then, but this is a collection of the writings from the year basically 100 to 600 that have been preserved. And unless you've been introduced somewhere to church history, you, uh, m most churches aren't even aware that there is this long tradition. Many of, this, many of these writings are actually kind of commentaries. They're uh, historical materials, uh, various things that early Christians, or at least uh, patristic Christians, thought needed to be preserved. By the way, you can still get this entire set, usually from Christian books distributors, at a really super price. I was able to pick up the red volumes, which are closest to the period I love to work with, you know, the, the early materials for about $100 for the entire collection. So, and they're also available pretty freely online. They're also a bit stilted in English because they were translated about 1900. So, so that all goes together. But in this material, you have uh, the Apostolic Fathers, which I'm going to introduce here in a bit. You have New Testament Apocrypha, which is materials that uh, very much like the Old Testament, uh, birth narratives of Jesus, things to fill in the gaps kind of material. Those, you've, got, you've got various um, Gospels of Thomas, Gospel of, of James. There's just a variety of stuff none of which anybody thinks has real historic value other than it helps you see what certain Christians were thinking at a certain time. But they don't really help you build kind of a, a you know, a historical timeline. There is around the year 160 ed, a group of writers uh, of which one shows up in the collection we call the Apostolic Fathers. But there's a group of writers that we would call the apologists, and these were Greek-speaking, sophisticated Greek-speaking Christians who were trying to explain the faith to the Roman Empire. And these, these uh, apologists are, in fact, taking the position that you're mistreating us just because we're Christians, not because we did something bad. That's kind of a, a main argument there, but Justin Martyr would be one of these writers. And Justin's writings come to us from about the year 160. When we move into the third century, we, we end up, we begin to get the list of, of what I would call kind of the famous, the golden writers of the, of the patristic period. You end up getting Irenaeus. Irenaeus, by the way, uh, writes a book. He, he's the first one to start cataloging the heretics. And so he'll give us a, a catalog, basically a list of descriptions. Here's what they're called and here's what they believed. And you can actually find that Irenaeus's apologies uh, are still available today. Hippolytus is working around Rome. Uh, Clement of Alexandria, obviously from Alexandria. Uh, 
uh, puts us about to year 180, 160, 180. Cyprian, uh, Tertullian, uh, Origen. The more you study this material, these are names that you'll, you, you will hear quite often. And I can assure you that by the time you get to Irenaeus, where we're talking 1, 180, 190, uh, in play is all the books of the New Testament, basically. Anyway, oh, there's so much more. You guys, you guys are in my sweet spot, so. Here are the writings that we normally collect in the uh, writings we call the Apostolic Fathers. First Clement, also written around the year 96. Second Clement, falsely named. It's a, it's a sermon that probably dates a little later in the second century. Somehow Clement's name got attached to it and they called it Second Clement, but we don't think it's by Clement. It is a great example, though, of what you might have heard as a Christian sermon in, say, the year 150. So if you want to go to church in 150, go read Second Clement. There is a collection of letters which date from about probably 117 would probably be the right date. And they are from Ignatius of Antioch. Ignatius is a tricky name in church history because there's, there's the other Ignatius later on that is the, cap, the, the Catholic monastery guy. That's not who we're, we're talking about somebody very early. Ignatius writes a series of letters as he's being taken from Antioch to Rome to suffer martyrdom. And he happens to go through what we would call Asia Minor. And you're right, you will actually recognize some of these locations. These letters are well worth reading. And they're in that little collection of the early Christian writers. So if you want to get a first sample of those, that would be a place to. to. And in this collection, we have um, letters written to the Ephesians church, the church at Magnesia, the church at Trellis, Rome. At Rome. Uh, the Roman letters sent ahead, apparently. Uh, Philadelphia, uh, Philadelphia, the Smyrna, the church at Smyrna. And there's also a letter there to Polycarp. And also in the collection of writings we now call the Apostolic Father, there is Polycarp's letter to the Philippians. You see how, the, how important this must be historically to figure out what's going on. So we're talking about the time just shortly after what most folks would date the book of Revelation. And then you've got uh, what looks like a very, in fact, it may even be like a, re a recorder's report of the martyrdom of Polycarp. Absolutely unbelievable. And it tells the story of him being put to death. There is, we include here the Didache because of its early date. There is a document called the Epistle of Barnabas, which is kind of the first Christian anti-Jewish piece of writings. It's pretty hostile towards Jews. And so we began to get uh, maybe even the first hints of what we might later call anti-Semitism. But the Epistle of Barnabas and the Shepherd of Hermas, which is another apocalyptic writing, uh, these were important enough that the early Christians actually included them in early, early manuscripts of, the, of New Testament books. Where they can, well, I think for a while they were canon in the sense that early Christians were using them more, and then later on in time, they're not using them so much. But they are of value because the early Christians, we know, not only did the early Christians write them, they're also reading them. There is, and, and Ed, this is that other apologetic work. We don't know where to date it, and we don't know exactly who wrote it. But it's, it's a defense of the early Christians and that they're not a threat to the empire. And it's called the Epistle to Diognetus. And then some folks include the fragments. Quadratus is another um, apologist. There is, Papias here is not his entire works at all. In fact, it's the little fragments that we've found. And then there's a group of, of uh, writings that's probably attached to Papias or Papias that is the tradition of the elders. So I, this is the earliest collection of materials that is right after the apostles. 
Okay. Ed has a question. Yes. Uh, he said, did I miss you give the approximate date range of the Apostolic Fathers writings? I didn't give a collective, but I would say that we know the earliest stuff comes from 96. And I would go as late as, we don't know where to date some of the, some of the, the Epistle of Diognetus could be as late as 200. The only thing that we seem to know uh, clearly is Ignatius is around 117. And so um, Polycarp's material is going to be about 117, 120. Yeah. So we're dealing basically with the first 100 years or so after, after the year 100 or so. Yeah. Dr. Stan, I just want to. Um, comment on the fact of I wonder if Adam and Eve learned how to write because we we count on these writings we really we really do count on these writings to fill in uh, in fact uh, let me let me take a few moments to make historians out of you historians are those who actually work with the sources and then they build history based on what they're reading in the sources. Yeah, I think sometimes we think uh, history is a concrete thing that, uh, that, you know, once somebody's written history, that's how it really happened. But if you're going to, the other thing is, this looks like a lot of material. It's still not enough to actually do an adequate history of this time period. Yeah, in fact, the years from, uh, from the Jewish war to until about 160, it's the hardest piece of history, Christian history to write, because there's just not enough sources to fill in the gaps the way we would typically want gaps to be filled in. And so oftentimes history in this period is written in kind of big swipes. For example, we know that in the first century, the early churches were composed of independent but connected congregations that were led by elders. There, were no, there, there was not a single individual known as pastor. That's kind of a modern invention, uh, or at least a more modern invention. Um, and these churches tended to uh, be led by, by the way, the elders would have been what we would have called the paid staff. They would actually have been supported by the congregation so that they could do ministerial kind of works. And that's why the early churches were often composed of folks who were fairly well to do at the elder level in the sense that their household provided the, the shelter uh, where the churches met. Ignatius though is pleading by the year 117 and it's not universal, but he's pleading that every church have a single bishop but multiple elders under that bishop and so we see in in uh, ignatius's writing the first indication that we've got any sense of a hierarchy developing but i wouldn't say that it's a roman hierarchy and the reason that ignatius thinks that you need a single bishop is you need one person to keep the heretics from saying all kinds of things and so it's, it's actually kind of an anti heretical move to make sure somebody respectable is is kind of in charge at the church you know is that kind of so again great material just by the way I, I want to say this again I am so grateful that you took the time of taking the time to learn this because it's so much of it is brand new to me or uh -huh. or a filling in of a of a paragraph that I had maybe one thought about so thank you thank you yeah, by the way, if any of you are going to pick up the Apostolic and Fathers and read, I would recommend that you read the Didache first just because it's a little more familiar in terms of the kind of material there. I would actually read Ignatius's letters next because they feel very much like the New Testament letters. And you've got skills there. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, you're welcome to this chart, but this is an attempt to give you some dates. By the way, here's your dates, uh, Ed, on some of this material, but it also kind of tells you a little bit about where, 
geographically where does this come from? By the way, rem remember the collection of the apostolic fathers is not something that circulated in the ancient world. It's basically pulling together materials from the same time period and putting them under the same cover, kind of a modern move. Uh, I'll just, I wanna keep us moving here. Um, let me see. Here's, here's where I wanna get you to. By the way, you, you're welcome to the entire slideshow and I'll be glad to throw it in, in, uh, in chat here in a minute. All right, folks, it's in chat. You should be able to get it yourself. Back in 1905, there was a group of scholars at Oxford who actually never gave their name to the book they actually wrote. The book is called The New Testament in the Apostolic Fathers. And um, in fact, uh, when you put it, the author is a committee. Various people wrote different parts of it. But what they were attempting to do in this book, and they go through very carefully, they try to find every citation of the New Testament or what, what becomes the New Testament in the Apostolic Fathers. And they use a rating system in which they basically say, A means they absolutely are for certain that they've got a citation from the New Testament. D is on the other end of the scale. Like we, we've got some doubts. What they're basically saying with D is that we've got illusions that are close enough to make us think that they had to have it. An illusion, of course, wouldn't be direct enough to say we've got a citation. A question mark is we don't know, but this was their basically their scale, their rating scale of what they could find. And so when you're looking at Barnabas, you're looking like they, we think we've got some Matthew there. We definitely have Romans there because the B rating, you, you kind of get A means we really do have it. D's, we've got D, the D end, we've got a little bit of doubt about it. And this is what we can say in terms of the Apostolic Fathers. And that's why I wanted to introduce the Apostolic Fathers is outside of, in fact, go, go along the scale and look here. Second Peter doesn't show up at all. Maybe, notice there's a question mark, maybe Second Clement, but no real evidence. First John's got some evidence in uh, First Clement and then a C rating up in Polycarp. No evidence that there is anything in Second John, no evidence of Third John anywhere. The Apocalypse or Revelation, maybe First Clement seems to know it, but nobody else does. So you get a sense of how the chart works. Now, this is their summary, summary chart. And by the way, this book, you can find it online. So go look it up if you actually want to see the, the blow by blow. But what they do is they, they take the uh, citation from the Apostolic Father. They set it against the citation in the New Testament, and then they give a little bit of an expl explanation for what they're seeing and why they think it lines up. There was another study just done a few years ago by um, Tucker's one of the authors, but it was kind of the round two of this study. Amazingly, they didn't really improve it much. These guys, these guys did their work so well. So, we're probably going to have to have another conversation about canon here in about two weeks. Jana, you're up to that? Because I want to take you all the way up to the time where we have Eusebius telling us, here's the books we use. Here's the books that are useful in the life of the church. Here's the books that are very, very iffy. And when we're talking Eusebius, we're talking fourth century. But what I want you to see and why I think this is so important is that the church in the second century is already using the documents with the exceptions. By the way, I'm not at all surprised that second and third John and second Peter doesn't show up because Eusebius in the fourth century is going to tell us that there are churches that still 
wonder about the authenticity of those letters. The Syrian church, by the way, the Syrian part of the Orthodox church doesn't accept Jude until the sixth century. And you got a couple of question marks there. So, so here's what I'd like to uh, kind of close this out today with is that the canon, I want to put this in your mind, the canon is not an official list. It is the books that the church ultimately finds useful. What about the thought when you say when we talk about canon, um, I, I, I've often wondered this because there's that component that it's what you would call divinely inspired. It's God's word. Mm -hmm. So when you use the word not useful or not helpful, there's that there's that part of me that looks at these things by the apostolic fathers and saying it's good that they are affirming what was the, the, the letters of the apostles, we'll use that part, or the, what was considered standard, what, what's another word, like for sure, uh, of the Old Testament. But there's a part of me that questions why their stuff wouldn't have been included. Is it just because they are quoting or, or speaking about the apostles? Um, the way I learned this originally is that there were certain criteria. Was it apostolic? Right. Was it was it consistent with doctrine? And I think there was a couple more. I'll pull those for next time. F.F. Uh, F. Bruce is famous for giving us those four categories, but you run into problems with them very quickly because two of our gospels are not written by folks who were known as apostles. Right. Yeah. And so uh, apostolic was not, uh, unless you broadly go apostolic, related to the other apostles. What I want to introduce you to uh, next week is that the early church had a concept known as the rule of faith. And they actually had a set of teachings that gave them boundaries before they had what we might call the New Testament. And so I'll introduce that next week called the rule of faith and a little bit about what had to be there in order for it to be there. Um, we've got several documents in our New Testament that if we did not have, we probably wouldn't be deficient in faith. Right, right. You know? Um, the other conversation that we probably ought to have is how the... Um, how the concept of inspiration became a hot ticket item in the modern world. Listen, the ancient believed that God spoke through scripture and they believed scripture to be true. But there's points along the way in which they think that included the shepherd of Hermas. There are, there are apostolic writers who will uh, quote the Apocrypha as scripture. And so there is a little bit of a flux, particularly in the early period of the church. But the approach that I like here is, can we find the places where what we know as the New Testament is being used? Yeah. And is it being used in an authoritative way? Yeah. Which means that the church is reading it. One of, one of the fascinating places you'll find in First Clement, let me tell you a little bit about the background of First Clement. First Clement is a letter by Clement, although he's not named at all in the letter. It is a letter from the church at Rome to the church in Corinth. The church in Corinth has recently had some young leaders get rid of some old leaders. So basically they've kicked out the old leaders. Whether this is Rome's first attempt to exert authority over other churches or it's two sister churches trying to help each other, Anyway, First Clement is encouraging uh, the Corinthian church to get itself in order and to repent of that act of rebellion. First Clement mentions Paul's letters 
to the Corinthians and quotes from it. Wow, wow, wow. And he mentions very specifically in a way that you know that there is a copy of it at Rome and there's a copy of it in Corinth. And so you get, you get actual evidence that whether Paul's letter is scripture yet, it certainly has authoritative voice, authoritative voice in the life of the church. That's so what to, makes I'm, sense to me. That, I like that phrase, authoritative voice. Yes. That makes good sense. Yeah. I, I think the early church had a, a little bit better balance uh, in the sense that they weren't troubled by the kind of questions we're raising here because they were deeply convinced that Christ was true. We tend, to, we tend to do the other way around and we need scripture to be true in order for Christ to be true. The early Christians are probably working it the other way around because Christ is true, scripture is true. You feel, can you feel how that might, might be the world that you live in? And again, um, I think uh, the role of leaders held glue together. And so you've got, you've got more than just authoritative books holding people together. You've got common story, you've got churches, you know, there's more to this life than just the books themselves. Mm 